All right. Um, so I'm going to run through some of the uh, research that we have going on down in southwest Ohio. Um, I came to southwest Ohio in uh, 2003. I'm a systems ecologist. I was really interested. The US EPA has traditionally been really good about assessing problems, uh, but in my opinion, solely my opinion, um, not very good about fixing problems uh, or, or providing guidance on um, on uh, fixing problems. So uh, as a systems ecologist, I have to take a whole systems approach to uh, water quality issues. And I was tasked with setting up a research program in watershed management, um, trying to better understand uh, procedures and processes related to watershed management. And there was two things in my mind as an experimental scientist I needed to do that. One was an experimental system, a real watershed uh, that was relevant to the problems of the day to study. And another um, was uh, the ability to do experiments on small stream ecosystems, specific controlled studies um, in laboratory. I work a lot at what, what's called the MISA scale, which is kind of halfway between the laboratory and the field, which makes um, our studies on ecotoxicology more relevant to field conditions. So I was looking for these two things, where I could set up an experimental uh, system to do stream studies and a watershed study. And I was directed to the experimental stream facility, which um, is just east of Cincinnati in Milford, Ohio. It was originally built by the Procter & Gamble Corporation to do uh, ecotoxicology studies on their commercial products, uh, soaps and detergents and whatnot. Um, the stream facility sits here, and when I walked into the facility, there was a large map on the wall that showed not the outline of this watershed, but the large system that was feeding water to this facility. We're bringing water into this system 24-7. We rely on it for, um, for our experiments, so uh, we would be a stakeholder of water quality in this watershed should we take over that facility. I started doing some research on this watershed. It's called the East Fork of the Little Miami River and realized that it was a mixed use system, very relevant, very typical in many aspects um, of a Midwestern watershed that was uh, dominated with agriculture, but also urbanizing and had a fairly um, significant urban area in the east here, which is, uh, so Cincinnati sits here. So the watershed is a contributor to the Ohio River Ohio River goes to the Mississippi, the Mississippi goes to the Gulf. Uh, in the Gulf, we have a hypoxia problem, and we're all trying to manage nutrients better in the Mississippi River Basin, so this would contribute to that. Uh, so it looked like a good system to set up a case study in. We also have this uh, reservoir here that was, um, is uh, managed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. It's a drinking water system, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that later, but this is now a source water protection area because of that drinking water system, so it makes it um, pretty relevant. This is the uh, picture of um, uh, the inside of the stream facility. I encourage you all, if you're in the southwest area um, in the summertime, please pop in on us because that's when we're actively doing research and uh, can be pretty exciting. We, um, we use these mesocosms. These are eight channel units, and each half is one mesocosm. We recreate a stream riffle section in these and has a full complement of bacteria, algae, bugs, all the way up to small minnows we get in here. And we can essentially do really controlled experiments where we're dosing uh, these systems, and it gets us a whole community response. Um, the, the facility doesn't it doesn't do justice to really talk about it. You have to see it. So I'm not going <clears> to <throat> spend a whole lot of time on it. We had some goals to begin with when we got into the facility. We wanted to make it one of the most realistic stream simulations in the world. We have advanced control that's uh, really state of the practice for the world in terms of um, uh, experimental facilities. And we can essentially mimic a wastewater discharge situation to a natural stream or a non-point rainfall runoff type situation to a natural stream community. 
We can uh, really control the concentrations of contaminants that we might be interested in studying in this system. And we have um, come up with some um, interesting methods to be able to capture a whole community effect. So we're not just, we are looking at individual organism responses to contamination, but also the whole community level. Because it's that community scale that ultimately the state environmental protection agency is doing their bioassessments on, and they're using to qualify whether a stream is impacted or not. Uh, so we want to get that community response. This is a picture of us measuring adult, setting up to a major adult insect emergence. So that's the uh, adult insects emerging from the larval stage out of the stream. We can capture those adults merging, emerging and then count them and classify them and that gives it and compare them across our treatment channels and that gives us a way to understand the community impact, uh, community level impact of an of a experimental effect. The, the facility has uh, become handy when we start looking at the watershed. This is a map of the bioassessment that the Ohio EPA did in 2012 for the East Fork watershed. There were 85 sites assessed and everyone in um, red and yellow there is in non-attainment. Uh, under law now, under Ohio law, each one of those HUC 12s um, that are if, if there's an assessment area that falls within a HUC-12, then it's going to require a TMDL. And so in order to get to that TMDL, the state has to decide on targets for, and we know that what's related to these bioassessments is excess nutrients. And so the state now has to identify targets for those nutrients to bring these systems that are impacted into attainment and those targets need to be based on science. And so our uh, stream facility studies over the past uh, few years have been focusing on validating those targets, making a specific link between nutrients and the community structure that will help validate the targets that the state ultimately chooses. That's all I'm going to say about the stream facility um, from here on out. I'm going to focus now on uh, the watershed work and our experimental uh, system that we have going on there. We have a very dense monitoring network in this site. This is a 500 mile square watershed, 325,000 acres. Um, it's a good chunk and that size ends up being kind of a sweet spot for using watershed models that can actually go from a parcel scale all the way up to a relevant watershed scale. When you get beyond this size, you kind of have to start using multiple models because one model can't handle it. When we first started doing this work, we're uh, using the SWAT model, and the SWAT model um, it was really, is really tapped out in terms, terms of its uh, capabilities when you're trying to go from a field scale to a, to a large system like uh, this 500-mile squared system. Anyway, we have over 30 sites that are monitored weekly. Some are monitored daily. And um, we've also started focusing on monitoring in the lake. All that monitoring fuels the modeling. So the modeling is really just being used to integrate the monitoring information. This is uh, what the lake looks like up close. We have seven sites on the lake. Um, we're getting the main inflows and the overflow weekly and, um, and these sites in the lake every three weeks year round. It's a 2,000 acre lake and it is uh, very similar to several other reservoirs in this region. We have um, 20 reservoirs in the Louisville district that are managed by the Louisville district of the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, they're shown here. Harsha Lake uh, or East Fork Lake is right here with, and these are their watersheds. Um, this uh, these are the 20 reservoirs listed over here, and the ones in orange are dominated with agriculture in the watershed. And the ones in blue are um, mostly forested, and we have one urban system. The Corps has been monitoring these reservoirs going back to 1988. They were all built in the, um, in the late 70s. We spent the last three or four years trying to collate all that monitoring data from the Corps and that has allowed us to assess 
uh, the cyanobacteria problem in these systems, um, whether this is something that we're just getting familiar with and therefore we're looking for it so we're seeing it more often or is this a problem in these lake systems that's been uh, gradually increasing. And what we see on the left here is cyanobacteria cell counts um, on an on a arithmetic scale for, for dramatic reasons. Um, we see the, the 100,000 cells per milliliter is the line that the World Health Organization says if you're swimming in this stuff, you're probably going to be, your health is going to be at risk. And we can see that all but the forested reservoirs started going above this relative risk line around about 2008. Uh, this is Harsha Lake, our, our case study system. There are several reservoirs that are seeing more algae, but this is a dramatic increase in cyanobacteria cells starting in 2008. We really started becoming concerned about it. The drinking water treatment plant operation in the lake started becoming concerned about it in 2010. We started seeing beach advisories, swimming advisories in 2012. This is just another way of looking at that trend um, with the yellow being where we were seeing moderate risk and then the red being the high risk category. This is on a, a log scale so it collapses that and makes it a little bit more apparent. Okay, what's causing that problem? Well, we know this is a real fancy way of saying it's related to temperature changes. We know that the cyanobacteria like it hot. They uh, get a competitive advantage over other types of algae at about 23, 24 degrees Celsius. And what we're seeing across all these 20 reservoirs is what the reservoir, in terms of temperature, the temperatures we are, that we used to see in June in the surface waters we now see in May. And those uh, May temperatures are giving an earlier competitive advantage to the cyanobacteria, allowing them to become the main uh, species of algae in these systems. We're also seeing that with that increase in cyanobacteria um, density, we're seeing the, uh, the periods of hypoxia in these systems used to go from the middle of July to the middle of September. Now they run from the middle of June to the middle of October. And that is really stressing fish. It's creating uh, real havoc for our drinking water treatment operations. And that's a function of all that algae that's in there dying. OK. So we've got temperature. Can't do much to control temperature. We also know that the nutrients in this system are a regulating factor of algae in that lake. So we, again, we had the bioassessments in the stream that, that qualify nutrient enrichment as a problem for 52% of the stream sites assessed. And now we have linkages between nutrients and algae in the lake. This is the, uh, the trend for phosphorus in the lake from 1998 to 2015. It's, it's pretty much increased by a factor of five. And the total nitrogen has gone up from about 1,000 back in the day to now about 1,700. And we have a model that takes all those 20 reservoirs and significantly relates total Keldahl nitrogen and surface temperature to the amount of algae in the lake. And that's what, that's what this um, uh, graphic is showing. Okay, so what is the EPA uh, doing about this problem? It's not just me working in this system or other systems like it. I work for a national laboratory uh, that uh, has a presence across the entire nation. And one of our main objectives, I work in the Office of Research and Development, one of our primary purposes is to provide science to uh, inform policy. Whether, whether policy takes that information uh, and uses it is another thing. But we, um, so that's our goal, and we're doing that all over the, over the nation. Um, this lake, Harsha Lake, has become a, kind of a poster child for research and development activities. Right now, um, nationwide, we have four research and development tracks related to the algae problem. One, and I characterize them here as early warning and assessment, drinking water treatment, engineering, um, cyanotoxin, eco, and human toxicology. So this is actually looking at the toxicology of the cyanotoxins. And in fact, we are uh, considering a stream facility study that would dose cyanotoxins and see how they would be impacting the stream community, say from 
downstream uh, communities of these reservoirs. And then long-term nutrient management, which is where I'll spend uh, the rest of my time. This is where, uh, this is near and dear to my heart. I've been a nutrient cycling ecologist for, um, for a long time now. And one of the things that we use this system to start to explore is alternative approaches to regulating nutrients. We know that um, right now, under the Clean Water Act, the only authority that we have, the direct command and control authority, which we really don't like having to do, is uh, being able to hand control point sources. And we know that the non-point sources are unregulated under the Clean Water Act. Um, and so we're trying to develop alternative approaches to getting nutrient reduction without direct regulation. And one of those approaches that has been around and talked about for a long time is water quality trading. That is where you have a point source that is under permit to reduce its nutrient load could potentially buy credits from a non-point source upstream of them. Traditionally, uh, under the original model, uh, an agricultural producer that can reduce the same amount of nutrients for a lot less cost. And while that sounds like a great idea, but it really uh, has had a hard time proving successful in the nation. And so we've been trying to explore ways. I work with environmental economists to try to figure out how we might um, be able to alter that conceptual model a bit to make it more effective. We're looking at how uh, bringing non-traditional participants, is what the economists call them, to the market uh, might thicken the market a bit. The, the main reason why these markets don't work is because the supply and the demand, uh, so the demand for nutrient credits is uh, vastly lower than the supply, and so the market can't get going. So we're trying to thicken the market. And in order to even start exploring this issue, whether a market-based approach would work in a watershed of this size or larger, you have to have uh, cost information about what it's going to take to fix the problem. What are the nutrient reduction requirements? And as it turned out, uh, as of about four years ago, there wasn't really um, any specific guidance on how to derive that cost information. It was really kind of loosey-goosey. Um, so we set about trying to formalize a process for deriving that information. And that's what this 12-step program is here. Um, and I'm just going to kind of run through uh, what going to give you some context of what, what that all entails. So I've already talked about the monitoring. This identifies some critical components that will be needed for a monitoring program. Uh, four in particular, I'm not going to run through them, but there's also secondary considerations. And all these things kind of go to informing the model, calibrating the model so people can believe the model, um, and allowing you to track the effectiveness over the long term. That's critical. Second really critical thing we found out is you have to have a stakeholder group. And you all have to be able to get along. We could not parameterize our model, set it up correctly, without working directly with producers in the system. We do that a lot through our soil and water conservation districts. So we have this unique group. We call ourselves the East Fork Watershed Cooperative. And we've got federal, state, local, uh, local partners in this group. We meet quarterly, and we've been doing that since 2009. And it's been invaluable, not only to us understanding the system more and uh, helping to guide the research, uh, but it's also helping to bring more money into this system to get uh, practices on the ground. Next, you have to set defensible targets. This is a lot of data on this slide. It's more just uh, for drama than um, anything else, other than to say that we use our monitoring to set. We have two approaches that we recommend for setting targets in this system. We use our monitoring. We use a reference condition approach. And then we can also, uh, now we're using molecular techniques to identify change points in the communities uh, in the, growing in the streams, specifically the algae growing on the subsurface, or subsurface, on the benthos in the streams. We can look at molecular change points and use those to help identify targets. <clears throat> those targets for the reference condition approach and this new molecular approach line up pretty well. 
We take our model, I mentioned we use the SWAT model. It's a, it's a somewhat unique application in that we can get down to, this is a HUC-12 in the system, we can get down to the parcel scale where we can estimate nutrient runoff from those systems. That's validated by edge of field, um, an edge of field monitoring site in the system, which you'll be hearing more about in the next talk. Um, and then uh, we use that model and those targets to be able to identify the relative source distribution of nitrogen and phosphorus excess in the system, anywhere in the system. This is for uh, the, the actual load to Harsha Lake, but we could go all the way down to a single field scale, although it'd probably be irrelevant at that scale, but at a HUC-12 level, we could produce these pie charts also. So we're saying that there's a, the model and the monitoring are showing about 100,000 kilograms per year of phosphorus are going into the lake, about a million kilograms per year of nitrogen. And the source distribution, most of the phosphorus, 57%, um, just over most, uh, is um, soybean agriculture. We have two-third beans and one-third corn planted almost every year on 104,000 acres. And those beans are generating a lot of the phosphorus and the nitrogen runoff. Wastewater effluent in the system accounts for about 1%. There's nine wastewater treatment plants in the system. They're all pretty small. Uh, septic systems account for about 4% of the nitrogen, 2% of the phosphorus. So we take the model and we, uh, everybody has to reduce a little bit. Everybody, so to do an equitable, um, nutrient reduction requirement. We've come up with a method, and I can't get into that now, but what, what this table down here says is what the plant effluent nitrogen and phosphorus concentrations would need to be in order for them to be in compliance with these targets. Um, and at the watershed as a whole, we've got to decrease the phosphorus and nitrogen load by like 90% to get us back to those uh, pre-algae bloom conditions. It's a pretty big task. So how much is it going to cost? The other unique thing about the SWOT model is that we can uh, predict what, how management practices are going to affect the model anywhere in the watershed. And this is the results of those predictions. So several different monitoring scenarios where we have, um, we've looked at modeling scenarios where we've looked at residue management, cover crops, filter strips, grass waterways, constructed wetlands, reducing fertilizer by 20%, reducing fertilizer by 60%, repairing septic systems. All of these, uh, these actors here could be potential suppliers of credit in a market. Uh, this compares to the cost of the plant upgrades that is here. You can see that if we were putting in wetlands, waterways, or filter strips, or cover crops, we could get, this is pound of phosphorus or nitrogen, uh, the cost per pound reduction. So we could get those uh, reductions for a handful of dollars compared to if we were treating wastewater plants, it would cost us about $2,000 to get a pound of reduction. Uh, believe it or not, septic system repair is even more than that for a, a pound of phosphorus or nitrogen reduction. And to put this into better context, so under the Clean Water Act and point source regulation, the point sources are responsible for 1% of the phosphorus load in this system. And if we make them comply with that, they're going to have to spend $5.4 million across the nine plants to upgrade uh, to reduce those nutrients to the levels they need to be. Alternatively, they could spend $425,000 buying credits from cover crops over only 7,900 acres of land and get the same amount of phosphorus removal. To say that another way, or to flip that around, if you took the five and a half million dollars and spent it on cover crops, if we assume cover crops are efficient at 50% efficiency, of their proposed <coughs> or their uh, modeled effectiveness, we could almost get all of the phosphorus removal we need at that rate. Now, 
However, you've probably heard that cover crops might not be so sufficient, uh, efficient at phosphorus removal. So if we instead consider that they're very inefficient, then we're not going to get this problem fixed by using cover crops alone. And this is uh, our low cost solution of, um, uh, for fixing the phosphorus problem in this watershed. It's going to cost us uh, between three and a half and eight million dollars a year from here on out. As long as everything stays the same in the watershed, we're going to have to spend this level of money annually to get, keep this phosphorus load in check. With that level, we would get about half of the nitrogen reduction, and we think the ecology would come in line. For, because uh, I'm going to compare this at the end of this slide to the Maumee River, this is going to be um, about $250,000 to $600,000 per Huck 12 to uh, take care of this phosphorus problem. It's going to take three different practices. We're going to need wetlands, filter strips, and cover crops. And we're going to need wetlands on 1,000 acres, so uh, 100 acres of wetland treating, or sorry, one acre of wetland treating 100 acres of row crop, 2,600 acres of filter strips, and half of the row crop is going to have to be in cover crop. That's our low cost solution. To put this into context, drinking water treatment plants spend $650,000 a year to manage the cyanotoxin issue. Um, this cost would be about 20% of annual row crop net income in the watershed. So that net income is $30 million. We're looking at about 20% of it uh, would have to be spent on nutrient management. Outdoor recreation to this system, uh, at least it used to bring $2 million into the, into the system. Uh, that's a cost that's going, uh, a, a gain that's going down that potentially could come back. Um, and so far, we have been able to obligate $2.75 million in equip dollars into this system over the last 10 years. We've gone from 100 acres of cover crops when I first started to now 17,000 acres. We're halfway there. Um, I think we're really gaining momentum in this system. It's a real positive message here. That's not enough acreage, though, for us to measure a difference yet. I'm up. I've got 20. I've got two more minutes. <laughs> All right. Um, just to put this in context, I'll end here real quick. Um, right now, I think we're scheduled to spend around $85 million in the Maumee River to deal with the Western Basin Lake Erie. Uh, given the number of hucks that are in the, Western, uh, in the Maumee River watershed, that comes down to about $250,000 per huck, which is pretty close to our low end estimate to fix the problem in the East Fork. So I think we're, um, we're on track, and I think the, uh, this, this shows that maybe um, both of us are in line with um, the realities of what it's going to take to fix this issue. What I'm not going to be able to talk about is uh, we, we decided to tackle, uh, first start tackling this wetlands problem, and we are actively doing research to figure out how, in God's name, we're going to get 1,000 acres of wetlands down in this system, knowing that um, we've got to pump uh, or move a whole lot of water through those wetlands to make them effective and get the, uh, the effect that we're seeing in the model. And we're finding that to be a significant challenge. Um, but uh, that's why we do research and development. So I really appreciate your attention. So I went a little bit over. And they said I can take a couple questions, so I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions for Steve? Chris. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, if I understand this right, we've got five times more phosphorus leaving the farm. Do you think the farmer's putting down five times more What, sorry, what was the last part of the question? I guess you, you said that we were, the farmer was basically more responsible for a five times increase in the amount of phosphorus since what, uh, before 2008? No, I didn't really say that. I, I said that there's five times more, there, there's five times more phosphorus in the lake. Okay, so 
than there was. Yeah, so there's, there, the lake was built in 1978, and ever since then, that 100,000 acres, or the 100,000 kilograms per year of phosphorus that's been going into it, half of it is staying in the lake. So we know what's going in, we know what's coming out. So we know that much phosphorus is staying in the lake. That's been accumulating, and so that is fueling the internal cycling of phosphorus that's driving the algae. So, I mean, ultimately, that is a mix of phosphorus coming from agriculture and point source loading and faulty septics. And on whole, the majority of that's going to be coming from um, agricultural uh, producers, but lands in row crop primarily, um, but not technically five times on that scale, if that makes any sense. So going forward, is there, a, is there anything, I guess, what has been explained to me is that acid rain is responsible for some of this. Oh. Because of the reduction in acid rain, and if pH neutral water makes plant availability and phosphates more plant available, so you get more algae bloom from it? No, that, um, so that, uh, there's a little bit of a, I'll, I can talk to you about that afterwards. I'd be happy to. I just, it's, it's a long, uh, a long sorted biogeochemistry uh, process there that I'd have to run through and I can't do it in two seconds. Sorry. Yeah. How much of the Yeah, so, right, 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 so what you're describing is what we're all calling now the legacy nutrient issue, um, and it's this legacy, this buildup of nutrients in the, in these reservoirs, um, and what to do about that. We are actively trying to figure out how to proportion out what level of, the, how much of the phosphorus that's driving the algae problem is coming from real time this year loading in these inland lakes versus sediments. One thing that happens in these lakes when they get the algae blooms to the extent that they do now, they somewhat disconnect themselves from the sediment and that the bloom becomes so active that all the nutrient turnover is happening in the water column itself. Um, and that's a pretty scary prospect to figure out how to manage.